So good afternoon, everyone. We are going to start with this uh, panel, uh, Building AI, Separating Real Hype, uh, Real Innovation from Hype. No, so I'm uh, Pepe Scamilla from Tecnológico de Monterrey. I, I am Associate Director of the Institute for the Future of Education. And uh, we have an accelerator there, and we get a lot of uh, uh, startups that want to be accelerated. And lately, we have had a lot of startups that want uh, to do um, tutor using generative AI. No? or that want to do a companion for students, or that want to do uh, uh, a companion for professors to prepare materials. And it's very hard for me to decide if those things are something that we should invest in, no? And I also get a lot of companies that come to sell things for Tech de Monterrey, and I am also in the same position, no? So which one should we invest for a pilot, no? So I would like to leave this panel with some ideas of how to separate which are the good things, the things we should invest, and the, the things uh, that maybe are just hypes. And what are the opportunities for entrepreneurs, like some of you that are here that are entrepreneurs, but also what are the challenges, okay? And I have a, a great panel here. I'm not allowed to present you, but uh, you have the names there. And I will start with a first question for Don. Uh, uh, so we have been using AI for a while. Um, uh, for instance, in, in Tech de Monterey, for several years, we started using Alex, I think like eight years ago, which is a product from McGraw-Hill. But we're using other um, ad, uh, cognitive tutors, no? adaptive learning uh, tools. Uh, if well, we have been using AI for that long, why now there's so much interest in AI? Oh, thank you, uh, Jose, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, so serious, you're making me nervous, so uh, I'll try to light it up a little bit. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've been using AI for a long time. We were talking about mathematicians, and Alan Turing, uh, I think, was using uh, something like AI, uh, you know, from almost 100 years ago. Uh, Marvin Minsky, uh, you know, 70 years ago. Um, um, ASU GSV, I think, has been around for over a decade. Uh, and every year people talk about how technology is going to revolutionize uh, learning. Um, so, but this, this year is, there is a difference, right? There is a show called AI Revolution Show. So obviously, um, you know, there, there, there is a difference. But uh, uh, let me try to tell it this way. There are two siblings. Uh, one is an older, older sibling, older brother called Trad uh, for traditional AI. And the other uh, sibling is uh, called Jan uh, for generative AI. Uh, and they, they are very different. Uh, the trad uh, likes to follow rules, uh, likes to, you know, obey things. Uh, but Jen is uh, wired, her brain is wired in neural networks, so she doesn't like to follow rules. She likes to absorb uh, data and information and uh, uh, become uh, kind of known, uh, become to know things uh, this way. So. The more we work, the, the more trad studies, uh, the more rigid uh, trad becomes. Uh, but the more uh, Jan studies, uh, the less rigid and the more creative uh, Jan becomes. And that's why we are so excited. Suppose uh, there is a competition for making a cake between the two siblings. Uh, you know, let's say we make a cake about uh, AI plus learning. Um, you know, I, I think what Trad would do is, uh, you know, think about AI. What kind of, what kind of flavor that would be? Uh, I don't know, uh, chocolate maybe. I don't know. Uh, what, what kind of flavor learning would be? You know, probably something more serious like, ooh, uh, oh, I don't know, caramel. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, Trad would probably come out with something completely different. With, you know, I, I, I don't know. Maybe the, a flavor of the sea or a uh, flavor of the moon. Um, and sometimes uh, that is amazing. Uh, you know, the way we define intelligence is a part of it, at least, is about adaptive learning. It's about growing, changing. Um, and I just cannot be more excited to be sharing and discussing with my panelists on how this era is going to revolutionize everything, including teaching mm -hmm. and learning. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Satya, you want to add something? Uh, yeah, question? Sure. sure, Jose. Uh, thanks, Dan. That was uh, a very interesting opening. Uh, so I just want to expand on uh, kind of what he's talking about, uh, the trad versus kind of the Gen AI. So if you go back to 2010, 2011, everything changed. Uh, so that's when 
the whole era of uh, deep learning started. And so what we're seeing now in 2024 is kind of the beginning of a revolution that happened in 2011. And reality neural networks have been around as well, much longer than that. But the neural network revolution eventually led to the rise of uh, something called the transformer technology in 2017, paper out of Google Brain, uh, that changed everything. So just to expand on what changed or why now, uh, so in the era of deep learning, so again, there was an era before deep learning where you know we were doing feature engineering, which was this idea that you can build AI based on specific features of your problem. It was not very scalable. And before that, there was the rules-based uh, era of AI. But the most important thing that happened in the deep learning era was you started making some real progress with statistical machine learning, uh, which uh, Victoria actually is one of the world's experts on. Um, <laughs> And uh, and so with statistical machine learning, one of the one, but one of the issues that we had with algorithms of that era was it was really hard to build algorithms that could simultaneously solve a bunch of problems. We were making progress with things like question answering. The Watson Jeopardy demo is a great example of that. Or Google Search was information retrieval. That was it's still around. It still uses neural networks. It's still the greatest AI application ever built. Uh, so we could do things like that in pieces. You could do information retrieval. Question answering was a, an aspect of information retrieval, but it was a part of AI called deep, deep Q&A. You could do some sentiment analysis. You could do some summarization. Uh, you could do some uh, level of uh, you know scoring or uh, analyzing uh, essays and doing essay scoring. In education, some of the best work that happened in AI in that era was out of ETS, uh, doing essay scoring. But everything changed in 2017. So it started with uh, 2011, the era of neural networks. Series of breakthroughs landed in the transformer era, which uh, you know, fast forward several years, uh, led to the chat GPT moment. So what really happened there? So what actually happened there is transformers had this marvelous quality that you could simultaneously uh, apply uh, kind of the ability to understand an input at the same time, not just do it sequentially, word by word or token by token. You can take an entire input and understand what's happening. And, and that allowed you to basically say, I understand the context, I understand the history, I understand where this is going. And, and one of the things that happened to Transformers is, and this is what OpenAI basically deserves a lot of credit for, the more data you poured into it, the bigger the, the, models, the, the, bigger the models became, the more powerful these things became. And so they, this is what's called scaling. So OpenAI first noticed it. Uh, again, Transformers came out of Google Brain 2017. All of us in the field thought that was an interesting paper. Uh, very few of us realized that as you actually made these things bigger and bigger, something incredible would happen. And OpenAI deserves a tremendous amount of credit for that. They just kept, make, kept making these bigger and bigger, throwing more data, more compute, and eventually GPT-3 happened, which was kind of the real revolution. Uh, GPT-3 predated chat GPT by a year, but by GPT-3, all of us who were sitting around in the field just sat up stunned at what had happened. Simultaneously, things that were very difficult to do in AI before, things like summarization, short answer scoring, generating prose, all these things were just solved by this one marvelous algorithm. And then they put a chatbot interface on top of it 10 months later, and and the world got to know about this. So, so today, AI has what, you know, the, the way we, we think of it is, uh, AI has a deeply formal understanding of the rules of language. It doesn't completely have a functional understanding of the rules of language, or language, functional being, it doesn't understand language the way you and I do, with uh, the embodied world cognition that we have, but there is a very formal understanding of language, and how to generate with it, how to parse it, tease it, et cetera. So that's basically what changed. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it has a, a, an impact in, in education uh, also because uh, it, make, it can make things faster to be developed. No, right? I was talking to Ryan Baker, a researcher in AI, that said that a traditional cognitive tutor, like the ones that we use uh, in many universities, can take six years of a person to program. And using generative AI, it can take maybe six months. So it makes financially possible to do things for smaller courses, uh, because normally you have to uh, amortize no, the, the cost of developing that. But let's shift now to education, and uh, let's uh, take uh, the, the technicalities there. 
and I want uh, shorter answers because we're running out of time. And so <laughs> please, uh, short answers. So I start with uh, Victoria about use cases, and I, I will let every one of you uh, go. What are the use cases that you are looking at uh, using generative AI in education? Sure. So definitely tons of use cases I'm sure you've seen at this conference alone in the AIR um, show and the general summit. Um, it's everything from personalization, and that personalization is not just, for our case, for example, with English language learning, it's not just proficiency levels, but it's also individual needs and pain points and the adaptability around that. But of course, if you look at the full spectrum, it's using the right kinds of AI models for the right use cases. I'll keep David. it pithy. Briefly, uh, because uh, Jose is speeding us up. Um, I would say one use case would be um, experiential learning, which I know sounds boring, but if you, I'll give you kind of a, a, a use case in a particular course area. So my focus is mostly higher education. If you think about an entrepreneurship class or a business class, uh, typically you know, a, a final exam or a final deliverable in those types of classes uh, is some kind of business case that you would write to show a product that you might launch, the go-to-market, all the financials and the like. And typically, that's most of the whole deliverable. What Gen AI is gonna allow us to do is actually give skills to students in those classes and allow them to not only write up a business case, but to actually use Gen AI to code a prototype in software and actually spin up marketing sites, create the content for those marketing sites, create all of the data and the analysis. And so it's not really even a simulation. Uh, it would actually be real life in the class doing it. Uh, because before, you wouldn't be able to do that because you wouldn't have the skill set. And AI is going to allow students to do that. It's one, uh, one use case. You will have like a proof of concept. Uh, of the... Well, I think you'll have more than a proof of concept. I think you'll actually have a working prototype working in the class. Okay. Yeah. Great. Um, Don, you want to add something? Or? Yeah, so a different family uh, story. Uh, there's this high school student called Kudus uh, from the UAE. Um, so he loves his country, but he, his task is writing an essay about the rise of the UAE. Um, he doesn't know where to start. Um, so he goes to a desert, um, and um, things show up as he interacts with the desert. Um, first, uh, buildings. Um, then people, um, then you know the vision of uh, technology in the future, um, and as he interacts with these things um, showing up in real time, uh, he has more ideas about what he's going to write about the essay, and then he starts writing, and as he's writing, um, there will be tips and assistance on you know, his writing. So th that's what we're building. Um, and by the way, Kudus is our founder who, who, dropped, uh, who just finished high school. Um, and he has a panel in um, uh, Seaport H, or Harbor H next door, uh, right after this. Uh, so if you want to hear the real uh, use case funding story, you should definitely go to that. Thank you, Dan. Satya? Um, just before this panel, actually, I was uh, walking into the room, and uh, I met Mike McCormick, who is the superintendent of Valverde School District um, here in California, Central, Central California. Um, and he told me an, an anecdote that really blew my mind. Uh, so uh, one of the big names in education is Vygotsky, and he's uh, very well known for the zone of proximal development. And he said there's something more interesting Vygotsky told, uh, taught us about education, which is that... At the heart of education, it's a deeply social process between two humans. Okay, it's the exact beating heart of the industry. So, uh, and that validated, you know, as a bunch of technologists who came into this field, you know, we're trying to learn this, uh, learn this field from the outside without formal backgrounds in cognitive science or learning science or, or things like that, but just some broad understanding of, you know, what happens with education. Um, and so when, when he said that, you know, it validated, you know, several years of work we've done in this field, which basically told us the most important variable or the most important, uh, you know, factor in education is the teacher in the room. And they have an impact on learning outcomes like nobody else can or nothing else. No intelligent tutor, cognitive tutor, no, you know, 
uh, smart board, uh, none of these things have an impact the way a teacher has. So my favorite use cases in education all revolve around uh, augmenting the teaching and learning process, helping the teacher, taking the time away from them, uh, analyzing, making them much more effic effective and efficient, mm -hmm. getting them to not feel so overburdened by, tech by technology and the process of teaching. So mm -hmm. uh, that's. Thank you. Thank you. So let, let's imagine in the following years that um, we will have uh, tools that are more powerful because as uh, computing power increases and data access to data and algorithms, we'll have uh, uh, generative AI uh, engines that are more powerful. And also uh, with all the information that I have here, I want to uh, ask a challenge, uh, David, to tell us what you think uh, will be the prevalent uses of AI in the following three years. <laughs> Get in a time machine. Um, so three years from now, I think we'll look back and wonder how any of us learned anything with general content. Uh, I think we'll look back and say, how did we all apply that general content to whatever our specific situation is, where we are, and what subject we were studying? So in three years' time, um, you know, we will experience hyper-contextualized content. The content will understand who you are. Uh, what your gender identity is, where you're located, what you're studying, what you want to do uh, for a job, and it will be tailored to you specifically. Um, and we'll all wonder, what was it like before that? Um, another use of, of Gen AI that will be true in the next three years, I believe, is um, more of a movement to interdisciplinary uh, combinations. So right now, again, my focus is mostly higher education. In a higher education, content and education is split up into discipline areas and course areas. And that's mostly artificial, to be honest, done by humans to make it organized and to make sense in what you're learning. Um, but as Gen AI gets more powerful, interdisciplinary experiences will increase. And in fact, that's what we all do on our jobs anyway. Um, and so we'll learn that way as well. And then uh, the last one I'll give you is um, I think in three years' time, uh, AR and VR will be more substantial. I think part of the challenge with AR and VR has been the scalability uh, and the ability to create content quickly, uh, adapt quickly, and honestly, the cost of that, which will go down over time with Gen AI. So those are three areas. I think we'll look back in three years mm -hmm. and wonder, what was it like before? Oh, so thank you for uh, getting the challenge. No? <laughs> sure. So now I have a rapid round for everyone. Is uh, one sentence. One sentence is uh, you start and then dot. No, so just one <laughs> sentence, and uh, it's uh, conci concise answers. No, that we want. What are, uh, we are reading a lot in the media of things that will happen. No, but many of them are exaggerated or not true. So if you tell me, can you tell me what do you think of what we are reading or hearing is exaggerated? Start with me. Uh, the automation of everything. So I think, uh, you know, we hear you're going to automate everything. And in fact, in learning, we should not do that uh, because learning needs to be inefficient in some ways. You need to have some struggle uh, to be able to learn. So the automation of everything won't happen and shouldn't in the context of learning. So there's a, like an uh, ideal level of stress to learn. Yes. I mean, the lower levels of blooms, we can automate some of that. Higher levels, you need the struggle to actually learn. You need, you need, you need that. And were you allowed to have semicolons in this sentence, hopefully? I used four. I used four. <laughs> so, um, so I think this is actually something that draws on what, Satya, you just mentioned. Um, I don't believe that this wave of AI or, or any kind of AI in this next frontier is going to replace the teacher. I think it really is meant to extend and augment and enhance and scale that teacher rather than become this you know, this AGI that's taking over your classroom and all your teachers are out of jobs. Um, I don't think that's the, I think that's overhyped. Thank you, Victoria. Satya? If I say I completely agree with that, is that my sentence? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll it's say, semicolon. yeah. <laughs> semicolon. Yeah, intelligent tutoring systems are never going to replace human teachers. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, I will not end humanity. Oh, but wow. <laughs> not, I will not replace humanity. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks for being concise. No, so. So now uh, my, my question uh, goes for Don. No? So what, what are the opportunities uh, in, of generative AI uh, in uh, emerging markets? And, and the question is because most of the discussion is assuming that uh, people have access, have scale or funding or um, 
are um, adequately educated, etc. And it's not the case uh, in emerging markets. So let's take a look at emerging markets and what do you think will be the opportunities for the use of generative AI in these markets? Yeah, so I think the panel is in, is in consensus that uh, AI is a, a force of augmentation for both uh, learning and teaching, uh, maybe for management as well. Um, so in developed countries, uh, there are lots of opportunities, obviously. And I, I think you know, in the US alone, there are, I don't know, hundreds of companies in pretty much every vertical uh, in this conference uh, you know, doing those things. Uh, but I, I think the bigger opportunity is in the emerging markets. Uh, and it's, it's because they're called emerging markets, right? They are developing, not developed. Uh, so there's, there's a huge gap between supply and demand. Uh, so I, I think UNESCO estimates there are a shortage of something like 50 million uh, teachers in K-12 alone. Um, so it is one thing to use generative AI to help alleviate the toil and the burden of teachers, uh, but it's, it's another thing to imagine a child growing up without a qualified teacher. Um, so I, I'm totally with the view that you know, AI cannot replace teachers or mothers or humans. Um, but this is a reality at the moment, uh, that many, many places in the world, uh, children are starved of uh, a proper education. Uh, and, and I think that's kind of the fundamental cause of most of the problems that we, we're facing in, in this world at the moment. Um, and, and that's, I think, the biggest impact uh, generative AI could have on humanity. Um, so, you know, imagine, you know, a, a, a companion who really understands the child empathetically, uh, who, who has a memory of the child growing up, um, and who knows the interest uh, of the child so that um, this companion could guide the child through the challenges and the passions uh, of the world offers. I think this, this is the most exciting product, that I can, uh, an impactful um, opportunity that I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Don. Uh, David, do you want to add something? Uh, yeah, I'll add something. I think um, you know, Gen AI is going to help some parts of the globe that have a difficult time investing in the technology needed to create high-quality learning experiences. The cost comes down. They'll be able to participate more. Um, I think something else to watch, which should be interesting, is uh, you know, Gen AI, uh, by definition, um, removes some control over the content that's created. That's both the exciting part and also the concern. So I think in... Uh, parts of the globe where control over content um, is is important, where censorship may be important, where content looking a certain way for whatever reason, cultural, political, religious, um, those parts of the globe are going to have to manage Gen AI in slightly different ways, uh, and it'll be interesting to see how they develop. Can, can I jump in on that? Yeah. Uh, I do believe it's actually possible to engineer all those controls with Gen AI. I don't think Gen AI removes it. I think Gen AI basically, if you were to use a large language model without any filters or any way to uh, engineer the outcome, then that's certainly true. But uh, there's there's been lots of uh, you know developments in the uh, in the field, uh, including things like uh, guardrails and safety models that allow you to control the output and to tailor it to the uh, to the values of uh, what people want. And of course, you can always get Gen AI to work off of a, a base content that also will. Uh, propagate those same values that are in the base content and not dip back on, on the training that it, it was fed to generate responses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I think there's a possible scenario also where there will be a new divide, no? because uh, um, if you're an institution that doesn't have um, your information organized in a way that you can leverage the power of AI uh, more systematically, no? uh, like a uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know if you have seen the systems of Western Governors uh, University where you log in and as a, um, a student you can see what are the job opportunities in the markets and the gaps that you have to acquire the credentials that you need to get that job, etc. I don't think many universities have that. Tech Demotory doesn't have that right now, for instance. So imagine the divide that can create when some universities or institutions have uh, this uh, data and they can grasp all the richness of that data to deliver a better experience with the students using AI. And, uh, and well, and link to that is access to technology, et cetera. So I, my recommendation will be to think in a future that uh, can have a bigger divide and think on how to avoid that divide uh, that rather than being optimistic in 
but th maybe it's because I come from an emerging country. And I, I see I see things uh, differently. So let's go to the next uh, the next question. So for uh, uh, David, uh, what challenges do tech entrepreneurs are facing to integrate AI in their tools, and how can they explore opportunities to overcome those challenges? Well, one challenge is I think the tension that exists between uh, investors in the market. Um, raise your hand if you have felt that tension in the room. No one has felt that tension. A um, couple, three people in the whole room have felt any tension about um, investors and the market. And what I mean by that is just that uh, investors and people funding uh, artificial intelligence want features to come out quicker. And the market has a developing level of readiness. And so you have to match the market's readiness with whatever you're developing and launching. So I think that's one, one challenge. Uh, the next is, um, you know, the, the arms race, Gen AI arms race, if you will, is rushing testing. And I think we have to be careful not to push out products that haven't been tested properly. Uh, and, you know, you, you've seen these out in the market, you know, chat GPT with a hat on, so to speak, as someone I work with says. Uh, so be careful of that. And then I would say just in terms of real innovation, uh, entrepreneurs... Um, need to need to slow down. We need to make sure that we're solving a problem, but when we solve a problem, we need to also make sure that we are changing the relationship between the content and the user, and in some instances, maybe even changing the paradigm altogether, so that now we have to operate or learn differently because of what we're pushing out. Just to push out a feature that solves a very discrete problem, not a bad thing to be doing, but if you're an entrepreneur who wants to receive funding, ongoing and actually turn a profit, you have to also change the relationship and change the paradigm. Thank you, David. What, what you all think. Uh, Victoria, do you want to add something? Um, yeah, I think one... You're living this, yeah. aren't you? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. A, lot of, uh, a lot of what you said makes a lot of sense to me. I think one significant challenge is in thinking, kind of one of your, I think your second point um, is on making sure that the solution we build is actually in service of the problem we're solving rather than a solution in search of a problem. So we have this great hammer, let's go find the shiniest nail. And instead, what's the actual problem? What's the right tool to use to solve that? And I think in some of that conversation, um, you know, kind of going back to, I think, Dun, you mentioned with, you know, Tread and Jen and that, that sibling um, relationship between AI and ML, traditional ML, um, is we kind of forget that there was AI and ML before generative AI, and that they serve valid use cases and purposes too around guardrails, and we can build in tandem with traditional models, classic ML and generative AI, um, and we always forget that, and I think that's to the disservice of a lot of especially underserved populations, where for example, for us, we work predominantly with adult learners. And you know, this conference and a lot of places, it's always K-12 focused, and a lot of times those learners who are underrepresented by the models themselves. Where you think about traditional mainstream LLMs, they're trained on Wikipedia, on New York Times articles. They're not, they're made for native speakers by native speakers. But what if you're dealing with an adult ESL immigrant who doesn't have that literacy? Then what's the right model? You can't just spin up a wrapper over ChatGPT and hope that works for your audience. You need to make sure you're actually building for the pain points that they have and building a solution that fits the problem. Thank you. So uh, uh, I think we will have time for one question. Uh, I was told not to take questions from You're the doing public, it anyway. But I, I, want, I like to break the rules. <laughs> but uh, that question has to be one sentence ending in a question mark. No? So <laughs> think of your question. Uh, so uh, I want to ask uh, Satya, no, on, on your experience in, in this area, what do you think are the uh, opportunities to uh, revolutionize the way that we increase learning outcomes uh, using AI? What, what are those opportunities in front of us? So it's, it's uh, look, at the end of the day, it's about uh, in K-12. So I'm going to address this uh, uh, from a K-12 learning perspective, but I'll also briefly dip into, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, higher ed and, and adult learning. So for K-12, it's, it's very simple. Help the teacher. Uh, so the AI has to help the teacher. And let the market tell you what the features are that the teachers need. 
Uh, is it about helping the teacher in the classroom, untethering them, as Mike McCormick told me that they've been trying to do for 15 years? Is it uh, in helping them create, create lesson plans, helping them bring beautiful experiential learning experiences into the classroom, as David talked about, uh, and help them by doing so with the right guardrails in place, with the right types of LLMs, as Victoria was talking about. You don't have to use chat GPT for everything, which is it's too big. Okay, So that's literally the most important thing we can do in K-12. In higher ed and in uh, corporate learning, adult learning, broadly what you have there is a very different situation. People are there who are already motivated. So motivation and engagement are the most important parts of learning. In higher ed, you're already motivated. You're trying to get a job. You're trying to uh, pass a test, uh, what have you. So they are learning tools that help students find information very quickly, efficiently, in a way that will help them get the, uh, the right material in time uh, is going to be very helpful. Thank you, Satya. Don, you want to add something? Or? Is it okay? Yeah, so, so I think uh, we work in, in K-12, and I, I, I agree with Satya that I think for K-12, the uh, prerequisite for improving learning outcome is uh, motivation. Um, and I think that's also perhaps the biggest problem in education at the moment. The system is not built around uh, that. Okay. Um, so, and, but I, I think generative AI could help a lot there. Yeah. Thank you. So now we can take uh, one question on the lady on the, there. Uh -huh. You. Uh -huh. Okay, the question is, uh, when you look at the tool, uh, what, uh, how do you decide if it's innovation or hype, no? Okay, okay. who wants to, what's the filter for that? Who wants to answer the question? Uh, I'll go. Okay, go ahead. Well, I'll give you a Venn diagram to evaluate the booth. How about that? <laughs> so imagine a Venn diagram where you have one circle that is, that is learning science, how people learn. And then you have another Venn diagram that is what is possible with generative AI? Okay, if I keep that as a, as a context. And then you have another circle that is the realities of learning, like in the classroom, the fact that we have time frames and we're in a you know, term semester, the like. Things that are true innovations are in the center of that Venn diagram. But what you'll find when you walk around the booths, they often are in one or the other three. Find the center of that, and that's probably innovation. Okay. If you agree, we take another question, and then I let another person answer. Please. Intelligent tutoring, I don't think it'll work. I think uh, we've seen this before, we've been down this road before. There's been uh, 15 years of uh, hype around personalized learning. There's been 50 years of work on intelligent tutoring systems in academia. Uh, people don't re realize that there's a very long academic history here. Uh, at the end of the day, it all comes back to, can a computer motivate a student like a human can? And the answer is no. Uh, I think it's a deeply social, deeply human process, going back to millions of years of evolution. It's, a, it's the wrong use of AI, and I think the field is misled. OK. One more. So the question is if we're building AI for institutions or for students. Is that a paradigm shift? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Thank you for the question. Who wants to answer? I can. Yeah, I can take that in a bit of a. You can tell me if I'm not exactly answering this question, but I do agree with you that there is a paradigm shift in it matters a lot more to build for the pain points of that end user. But I think to to kind of bridge to something Satya mentioned um, that I, I really also deeply agree with is. When we're building our product, for example, we, we're a B2B to C product, but when we thought, you know, the end, the end learner is that student, it's this adult learner, that's the C, but actually that C is the teacher. And the reason for that is once the teacher builds this tool into their tech routine and it becomes part of their classroom, the student engagement, all of that comes for free. And that's because the teacher is the one motivating and uh, working that in. 
And so in a lot of senses, it's yes, it's a paradigm shift, but we need to think more deeply about who is the user we're solving for. Thank you. One, one last one. <laughs> Sentence and. Um, do I get more than one sentence? Um, so I think yeah, that that's one. That's a start. I think I think there's just so much going where models are becoming increasingly locally customizable. So it's okay. There's rag, but why stop there? There's Qlora techniques to do local, yeah, and so many new open source models that are much smaller. The mixture of experts allows you to bring that locally, do fine tuning on that as well. It, it goes beyond RAG. And I think it's not really an either or. And I think it's, it's really all of the above and kind of can use the word ensembling loosely here, but ensembling across all of those methods of RAG, of localized fine tuning, of prompt engineering and why constrain yourself to just one? I think it's really, going back to an earlier question, the thoughtfulness around how you're piecing all of those models and techniques together. Thank you. So we, I, I have a, a final question for you uh, before we finish. The, the panel is like a, a piece of advice not to uh, entrepreneurs that are here. So what do you think are the critical factors to decide how to use AI in their solutions or put that? And what advice do you give them? What, what are the next steps or the things that you have to do? And the challenge is to do it in a very short answer, no, less than a minute. Less than a minute. Uh, here's some advice. Um, uh, timing. I work with someone who says be 10 minutes into the future. Um, and what he means by that is don't go too far because you're going to be alone wherever that is. Um, so, so time that. Have an ethical foundation. Everyone has specific questions about how you're using Gen AI. Work on that, publish it, edit it all the time. Solve a real problem. Don't create another one that's worse than the problem you solved. And then lastly, I would say understand the limitations of the AI and be willing to adapt when necessary. That was under a minute. Yeah, that was great. You stole one of mine, so I'm going to start with that one. Um, build for the problem. Don't be a, a tool or a solution in search of a problem and then co-create with your partners because they know the problem better than you do. Thank you, Victoria. Satya? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's actually the old-fashioned product market fit. Mm -hmm. Build a product that the market wants to actually buy and uh, use, and that solves real problems. It's as simple as that. Thank you. Yeah, very uh, similar. Um, so find a real problem um, built with a purpose. Um, I think at the end of the day, ask the students, the parents, the teachers, uh, if you're doing something, uh, forget about AI. Um, a, a great tool uh, is invisible. Uh, like if I want to go somewhere, uh, I want to go on a bike, I don't, I don't think about you know, how, whether it's RAG or prompt engineering that the bike uses. Um, so I, I think just be not, build something that's natural, um, and I, I think learning is. You know, I'm I'm uh, I'm with the view that I, I think most people would probably disagree. I think uh, learning is a big part of human nature and a big part of human human intelligence. Um, it's not against human nature. Um, so just uh, be more tuned into your that part of your nature. Thank you. Yeah, yesterday I was uh, in a, a private session and there was. Um, John Katzman was there, and he was telling young entrepreneurs that uh, the cycles of adoption in education are very slow, uh, both in higher education and K-12. Maybe not in you know lifelong learning, world workforce development. So that being first on the market is not necessarily something that gives you an edge, no, compared to others, because it takes time. So maybe also my advice will be to take time to have uh, some solution that is well ground the run the, no so you have a, a a better solution before going to the market because i think that's better than being first to the market so with this we still have one minute and something but uh, i will end the panel here and i thank you 
I, sorry to be running a little bit, but I wanted to take some questions from the public. I hope you enjoyed the panel as much as I did. Uh, thank you very much.